Uh, our first speaker today is joining us from out of the news, I'm going to say, is going to share some very exciting news with you today. Her name is Dr. Jennifer Sobet. She got her PhD at UT, and she's here to tell us today a bit about where the bling on your finger came from. Join me in welcoming Jen. slide switcher thing, but hopefully this will all work out. So I'd like to welcome you to the uh, October 2017 version of Astronomy on Tap. Um, I want you to know this is a really relaxed environment, um, obviously aided by beer. So in case you have any questions, please just raise your hand, scream out my name, Jen, and we'll go through it the best that we can. Heard that. <laughs> Okay, so the title of the talk is Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Money Around the Milky Way. And just so you know why I chose this theme, I hope it's not too dated. I hope there are some Hitchhiker's uh, Guide fans here. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Is that it turns out that my survey is a big fan too. And in fact, we have a bunch of software, we have a bunch of databases, all named after the characters that you see here in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So for instance, you can see, you can go to GitHub and you can look up Marvin and you will find some of the software products that we actually have. In fact, Marvin is just a really nice way to visualize some galaxies. So feeling a little bored, I'm going to take a look at galaxies. He'll uh, head on over to Marvin. So originally my talk was going to be all about stars. So it was going to be about stars, the Milky Way, and the telescopes that we actually use to observe these guys. So right here I have a photo of Proxima Centauri. Proxima Centauri is what to us? The closest star to us, exactly. And so I was going to have all focus on stars, their char characteristics, so forth and so on. And then we have a really nice space on view of our galaxy. You can see here is the center of our galaxy where there's a huge black hole. This is the bulge of our galaxy, a very dense concentration of stars. And then here are the disks, our spiral arms. And the location of our sun is just about here, three fifths out of the way, you know, out from the center of the galaxy. This right here is Las Campanas. If you ever really want to see the Milky Way, you have to head down to the southern hemisphere. It's just absolutely beautiful. Plus, the fact that going out to a place where there's not a lot of light, look up, and you'll be amazed by the number of stars that you can actually see out there. So this was my plan. And the one thing I was not going to do is talk about exoplanets. No exo, no plan, nothing. Not a zip zilch, because you guys have had some really wonderful presentations lately about exoplanets, but I wanted to take us somewhere different. And so the only time I was going to mention exoplanets is that they're objects that just orbit stars. Stars, stars. Five. As you can see, a little over a week ago, there was a team tiny announcement. Maybe some of you guys heard about this. And because of that, we have the LIGO announcement right here. So LIGO, which is the laser, anybody actually know what LIGO stands for? How many of these talks have you been to? Laser, Interrupting <laughs> Gravitational Wave Observatory. Virgo and various partners made the detection of gravitational waves from colliding neutron stars. So what you can see right here is that typical this uh, typical chirp signal right here. Both LIGO and Virgo did this detection. I'll talk about that in just a little bit. But since it's one of the few bits of positive news, because let's face that, it's time to put the poll right now. So it got a lot of plus coverage. So the New York Times called it, LIGO detects a fierce collision of neutron stars for the first time. CNN wrote, first seeing neutron star collision creates light, gravitational waves, and all of and then the New York Times wrote, it was a universe-shaking announcement. So I, I think my hand was forced at this point. So basically, what happened was this. So no more Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy tour, unfortunately. So I'm a stellar astrophysicist by trade. I don't know much that, that much about gravitational waves. But I do know a lot about neutron stars. In fact, I'm a big fan. So if you guys are ready, let's go. I'll take you there. 
So, gravitational wave detection. Now, you guys, if you've been going to these AOTs, you've probably heard a LIGO talk or two, but essentially, <laughs> this has to go right to my mouth. <laughs> anyway, essentially, it's two laser based facilities, uh, one located in the good old, oops, good old part of uh, Washington State in Hanford. As you can see, it's a really beautiful area in Washington State. The other part is Livingston. It's a place in uh, Louisiana. And so they use time delay essentially to detect gravitational wave signals. And so here's that really stereotypical images that you see, that indication that a gravitational wave detection has occurred. The true, that's what you see right here. And this is a really beautiful artist rendering of just two not neutron neutron stars colliding with one another. The detection of the actual signal was made on August 17, 2017. It is given the really lovely name of GW107817, so something really iconic and memorable. <laughs> so like I mentioned, you have the LIGO facilities first detecting this particular signal, and then you have Virgo following up. So in this particular diagram, you kind of see all the variable rotational wave observatories either operational or under construction. There's eventually going to be a LIGO India, which I think is going to be really cool. But all these things really truly help us to do a few things. First, it's signal verification. And second, it's signal localization. So it's, it's really kind of cool. Virgo, thank God, had actually just undergone a major upgrade. So Virgo's been around for a while. But what they did is they updated a lot of their software and hardware components. And just two weeks before the signal came on, they went, up, they went online. There was something else that was really unique about the signal, and something called Kilonova. And that actually accompanied the gravitational wave. So here we go, our first review of the event. <laughs> so normally there's really beautiful music that accompanies it. So what you see here are two neutron um, stars gravitationally attracted to one another. They're pulled into one another's um, gravitational wells. They circle around one another, and then they merge. Notice I'm not saying destruct one another. They merge with one another. Now, there are a couple different possibilities that come out of that merger. But it's something that we can uh, talk about just in just a little bit. Anybody want to see the video again? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I wish I could sing the music, but I would spare you that. So here you go, here they're orbiting around one another. And then, this is a video from NASA, so these are your tax dollars at work, as long as NASA still exists, so cross your fingers. <laughs> So what I've gone ahead and done is put out all the oops, put out all the various gravitational wave signals that, that LIGO has received, and I want to show you that this is the one from the recent recent neutron star merger event. And the very first thing that you can tell, it's longer, right? It's longer in duration. So here are the black hole black hole mergers, and here's the actual neutron star um, gravitational wave signal. Another thing that kind of tipped them off. So the actual shape of the signal looked like it was coming from two compact objects merging together. So the very shape plus the duration said, hey, we have neutron star mergers going on. The thing about this, and it's the thing that I hinted about, is not only do you have gravitational waves, but you have this thing called a kilonova. Anybody ever heard of a supernova before? Supernova, very huge, powerful, luminous explosion, right? This is the kilonova. What's bigger, a supernova or a kilonova? Supernova is bigger. So kilonova, don't get me wrong, kilonova's cool, okay? Kilonova's cool, I don't want to downplay the kilonova. But uh, it's a little bit less on the explosion scale, if you will, if I'm talking about stars in the universe and the cool stuff. So it's like Big Bang, okay, some black hole cool collisions, Maybe a few galaxy collisions, but supernova and then kilonova. So, so there is a scale, and just so you guys didn't know. 
Telenova means that we were able to have electromagnetic radiation across the spectrum that a whole bunch of facilities were actually able to monitor. So you can see here on this chart, I have the LIGO facility. So here are the gravitational wave facilities right here. And there are a bunch of blue dots. And these blue dots all participated in the follow-up of this particular event. So you have stuff on the ground and stuff in space. And just in case you guys don't remember your EM spectrum or your basic high school physics, I just wanted to <laughs> illustrate it for you really quickly. So we have short gamma rays. They are very, very high in, um, in energy. And they're very, very short in wavelength. And you go across the spectrum from gamma, x-ray, ultraviolet, visible, which is very crucial to us, by the way, first broken glass, <laughs> infrared, microwave, and radio. So radio waves have the longest wavelength and also the lowest energy. This is just kind of key and, and you know, just important to keep in mind. But the point is, is you're getting a different piece of information from all these parts of the spectrum. They all help to fill in that puzzle. So just to give you an idea of stuff that we have on the ground, so here's stuff like Peck, Gemini, Karma, and um, Green Bank. And so here again are gamma rays. Here again is radio, so you kind of have like this EM spectrum view, and the various actual satellites that observe at these different wavelengths. So for us, Fermi and Swift are going to come into play. Here's good old Hubble, and Hubble observes in the visible ultraviolet and infrared, actually. And so this is kind of all a view of all the facilities that really truly helped monitor this particular event. So, like I mentioned, there was a um, participation in many facilities, and one of the very first to do so was Fermi. So gravitational wave goes off, bam, or is received. And then 1.7 seconds later, Fermi picks up a gamma ray burst. So what's cool about this gamma ray burst? So here you can see the baseline signal, bam, burst. The burst is cool, but it's very short in duration, right? And it has a really, truly just a weak signal that they're used to. There's another facility, uh, so Fermi's a NASA instrument. Interpol is an ESA instrument, so European Space Agency. So about 66 minutes later, their world comes online. Again, sees the same detection right there. Between the LIGO, Virgo, gravitational wave observatories, plus also Fermi and Integral, they were actually able to locate the source of the signal, at least to a patch of sky, right? And this has never been done before. So they were able to use these types of observations to really locate the source of the signal. And they narrowed it down to about 30 square degrees of sky. This is when the optical observatories come in. So has anybody ever visited an observatory? Obviously. <laughs> okay, great. So first, if you haven't done it, I highly recommend it. But secondly, if you just ever want to be outside, looking at the night sky, unpolluted, it's just a great place to go. So this is a place called Los Campanas. It's in Chile. It's in the Atacama Desert, and it's absolutely amazing. I've had a really good fortune to visit there many, many times. This is one of the telescopes. It's a one-meter swoop. I know the trend right now is to move to larger and larger telescopes, but these little guys, they're still powerhouses. So they were able to use optical um, detection of this particular event about 11 hours later, and they were able to see first just through imaging what was going on. So what they did is they pretty much said, hey, what are the most luminous, well-known galaxies in the sky in this 30 square degree patch, right? And let's just start looking. So they scanned the skies, and they were actually able to find the source in NGC 4993, another memorable name. I don't know. <laughs> so just to show you the difference, only in the optical, here's a view of this particular galaxy right here on April 28th. Not nah, nah. Here it is on August 17th. Can you guys see that dot? That dot is the neutron neutron star aperture. Looking with it just a little bit of a larger aperture, you're able to see here. Here's the dot just one day later. And then on August 31st, the dot is no longer there. So this Kilinova explosion lasted for a period of only 15 days. So NGC 4993, just to keep you updated, is a galaxy, but it's not a galaxy like ours. It's not that far spiral type of galaxy. It's an elliptical galaxy. And there's not much star formation going on. And it's really heavily bulged dominated. So remember that central portion of the stars? 
completely dominated by that. So nothing like our own particular galaxy. And in fact, ooh, sorry, this is a little dense, but I'll kind of, kind of walk you through it really quickly. Not only did we look in you know, the gamma ray range, we looked at x-rays, UV, optical, IR. So here's the timeline. So here this axis just re represents time. So this is basically, you know, event occurrence right here. And you can see here's the turf, right? And this is the several days afterward. And you can notice gravitational wave follow-up occurred. The camera, then x-ray, and then radio. So radio is, again, the longest or the shortest of the wavelengths. I'm really not paying attention. I'm really not <laughs> So anyway, so here's Chandra. Hubble got in on the axe. There's a great paper um, just based off of the Hubble observations. Here are the, all, all of the various optical observations right here. And then even in the radio, they were able to follow this up. But one thing that they were able to make clear with all of these observations is what the explosion actually looks like. And that's just fascinating. To have that level of detail on the explosion, it's only possible through all these types of observations, just kind of compiling the data together and really making sense of what we saw. So pretend we're here, and this is the line of sight on the explosion. As you can actually see, it was a bit off axis, a bit tilted away from us, right? And so here's the original uh, jet of gamma rays right here. Here's the kilonova itself. It's slightly off axis to us, so we didn't receive quite the amount of radiation that we could have if it had been on axis like this. So I've talked about um, all the cool stuff, but now I'm going to talk about stars, because well, I love stars but primarily because this is a neutron star, neutron star merger event. So again, another dense slide, but I'll walk you through it. Is this actually? No. Okay. <laughs> there are essentially two pathways that stars can take. There's a low mass path and a high mass path. Most stars take this low mass track right here, it's including our own star, right? There's a huge uh, you know, hydrogen cloud. Basically, there's a protostar that forms. You spend the vast majority, like your adulthood, kind of existing as a dwarf star. You're doing this. You're burning hydrogen into helium. You're having a great time. Eventually, you get old. You no longer have a supply of hydrogen. You turn every, um, start turning to helium, and it's just not as efficient. So you become a red giant. Our own sun will become a red giant star. Where we currently sit right now will be engulfed by the red giant star. So, nice knowing you. Anyway. <laughs> Eventually, our sun really truly doesn't have enough energy. There's just not enough to, to retain the outer, outer layers of its atmosphere. And so just cast it off. And it all starts to float away and contribute to the interstellar medium. And our, our sun winds up a white dwarf. Right. This is the vast majority of stars. Here's the cool stuff. So if you're really high mass, we're talking in the range of roughly four to eight times the solar mass right here. You go through this, it's a protostar, huge dwarf, super giant. But it's really quick. The more massive you are, the faster you live. Go big, go home, right? So that's the idea. The cool thing is, is that you supernova. So remember supernova, you explode into this huge explosion. And if you're at the four to eight solar masses, you become a neutron star. If you're larger than this, you become a black hole. So this is the really cool track that these particular stars actually took, and they became neutron stars. But I can't emphasize enough how rare this actually is. So to come across this event is just really, really cool. We have about four billion years. So the question was, how long until our sun becomes a red giant? Don't worry, it's not like 30 days. <laughs> about four billion years, so we have some time. So what is a neutron star exactly? Why is it so damn cool? So what I wanted to do is give you a little bit of perspective of what you know a neutron star, what the fate of this you know, more seemingly normal but high mass star actually becomes. So here are some stars, Antares, Betelgeuse, Aldebaran, Rigel, Arcturus, uh, I can't read that one, <laughs> Pollux, sorry, Sirius, and this really little dot is our sun. So here's the sun. Beetlejuice. Sun, Beetlejuice. Sun. <laughs> just to uh, make it clear, so there's two things that, that play here in this diagram. One, of course, is just diameter, and the other is mass. Beetlejuice happens to weigh 
are, happens to have the mass of seven times of our sun. So Betelgeuse will, in fact, become a neutron star. But Betelgeuse can be observed from the naked eye. So if you get a chance to get out of here, you'll be able you know, just go to the back country, you'll be able to observe it. So when Betelgeuse becomes a neutron star, it will be compacted down to the size of 12 miles in diameter. It is one of the most dense objects that we can observe in the universe. So here's Betelgeuse, here's Manhattan. Betelgeuse the neutron star, I should say. It is so incredibly dense that if you took one teaspoon of Betelgeuse's neutron star matter, it would weigh more than every single person on the face of the Earth. These are amazing, amazing stars. So what does that mean exactly? If I'm taking something so enormous and so huge that I'm compacting it down, what is going on? What with the physics, right? What is going on with the star, right? And so, sorry, that was my cuss. <laughs> anyway, it's just so amazing to me. Anyway, the idea is, is that you have this neutron star, and it's about still about a little more massive than the sun, about 1.5 times the solar mass. It's 12 diameters, in, 12 miles in diameter, right? The um, actual exterior of the star, the upper layers, are solid crust. Solid. It's a star, right? But don't get me wrong, light can still permeate and reach us, but it's quite, quite interesting to think about that. And then inside, it's just basically a small. It's a hot mess. But everything's so compressed, we call it degenerate. What degenerate actually means is there are no more atoms. There are no more molecules. That, that thing, those are all blown apart, and it's just like a soup a soup of neutrons. There are just tons of neutrons. And the really cool thing is, down in the center, they think the pressures are so high that you actually might get quarks. So the subatomic level. It's really, really interesting. And here's just a view of neutron stars. They come in a couple different flavors. One of the flavors is called a pulsar. The other one is called a magnetar. Just absolutely fascinating. So now, if I talk about stars, I talk about elements. And there's a reason why. So here's a really beautiful view of the periodic table. And basically, all of the elements that you see here were manufactured in some sort of way by stars. There are just a few exceptions, and I'll get into those in just a second. But every single thing, everything that you know, everything that makes us up, everything that makes up the benches, the beer, thank God, everything came <laughs> from the stars. And so there's this really lovely quote from Carl Sagan, a guy who hasn't been with us for quite a while, but I still think makes an impact. And he says, we are made of star stuff. So if you get a chance, just go to head to this website. It's great. If you're bored, just click on stuff. You get a really nice, a nice introduction to all of the elements. I'm going to switch you know, stuff on you just a little bit. I'm going to flip this switch just a little bit and start talking about where these guys are actually made. And so this is from a friend of mine, Jennifer Johnson. And she wanted to really take the periodic table and say, hey, how is this stuff actually made? Let me just kind of draw, draw this and diagram it out. And so remember I mentioned those few stars that are the exceptions? It's these guys, hydrogen, helium, and lithium. These guys were made in the Big Bang. All the hydrogen that exists today, everything in the water, everything in your beer, comes from the Big Bang. So that's kind of not in stars. But everything else, okay, so there's the comic ray fission. We'll be pulling more that for just a second. Comes from stars. So things like, you know, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, these things all come from stars. There's stars that die that massive supernova death, and they contribute elements. There are stars that are white dwarfs and do something called a type 1 supernova that I can't get into. They contribute stuff. Now, just out of curiosity, if you, I'll give you five seconds to answer this question. If there's anybody who can tell me what that element is, I will buy them a beer. This one right here. Yeah, All right, shit, I will beer. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, promise, I will make it on that promise. I just swear I will. <laughs> but anyway, so, um, so, so this is just kind of a diagram showing you the source in each of one of these elements. So here's my friend, Dr. Jennifer Johnson. We've been friends for longer than I care to tell you guys. But the thing is, this merging neutron stars bit, it was just a hypothesis. We were hoping that this was the case, but we didn't know for sure. So at this point, it was just mere speculation. And so remember this bit? 
here's CNN. And they said, Neutron Star, Green School. Oh. That's cool, right? I mean, it's kind of like clickbait for sure, right? So, this is going to be, sorry, the most technical slide that I have, but I'm going to justify their statement right now. So first, I'm going to go ahead and just go ahead and talk about, um, here's the Galaxy NGC 4993. Here's that, you know, exit, no, sorry, um, that Kilanova event right here. And the very first thing I want you to notice, so here are the dates, um, August 17th and August 21st. So just four days apart. The first thing is it appears blue, right? And then just four days later, it's a bit red. But not just that, it's dimmed a bit. So this is a really fast occurring type of event. So we're focusing all of our telescopes and all the various bands on this particular event, trying to record as much information as possible. So this is a really nice plot from Draugenheim, and it's coming from that Lost Components Observatory that I was talking about. So there's a bunch of stuff on this plot, but I'm going to go ahead and try to dissect it really quickly. The first is apparent magnitude. So that's just basically AKA brightness. The second on the x-axis right here is just time from the merger, so it's just basically a timeline. And what you see is a bunch of numbers here. But this is the bluest of wavelengths. This is the reddest of wavelengths up here. So you're going from almost near UV up to really deep near infrared right here. So you're looking from blue to red. And the things that they noticed is, you know, yeah, at first there's, there's a bit of blue radiation, right? A blue-like light, right? But it very quickly dissipates. So again, this is showing, but with, with real data, just looking at these various photometric band passes, right? These various wavelengths of light saying, hey, can I get blue or can I get red? And why does this even mean anything to me? I'll tell you about that in a second. So not to be outdone, the theorists got into the act and they're like, oh, I have an explanation for this. It actually turns out this time they're gonna be right. But what they tried to do is say, hey, here's this light curve behavior. What could possibly be contributing to that? And so if we can go back to this real quick, so remember we're talking about these elements and the ones that are made in um, merging neutron stars? These guys are primarily them. They're called the lanthanides. And so, whoops. <laughs> so what the theorists did is they said, hey, they took this series of lanthanides and they varied the actual concentration of what they expected to come out in the ejecta from this Hillanova event. So the two neutron stars merge, and then they eject stuff. <laughs> and what is actually that ejecta made out of? And so they started with really low concentrations, and then they incre kept on increasing to very, very high. And then as you can see, so here again, it's just a timeline, days since merger. This is basically brightness right here. The brightness actually changes with the concentration of these elements. Same idea here, right? Here I'm looking in the UV, the optical, and the infrared. Based on the concentration of these elements, the light curve actually looks a little bit different. So they came up with a really nice cartoon. And in this case, it turns out to be really kind of cool and really kind of bright. What they showed is that here's the actual neutron neutron star merger event. Now, here's the thing I want to point out to you. Just because they got, these guys have merged doesn't mean there's not anything left. They can merge and actually become just another big, big old neutron star. But anyway, in this case, the light that comes out is very, very blue. And the only way it's blue is if you have a high concentration of these elements, so like silver, cadmium, indium, and tin right here. But if the light is more red focused, right, and more red in appearance to us and our observatories, it really contains stuff like this, platinum, gold, mercury, lead, and bismuth. And it turns out, as you guys remember, right, when I showed those two diagrams, um, this particular exonova went from blue very, very quickly to red. And it stayed red most of the time. So hence, we got a bunch of gold on our hands. This particular event took place 130 million light years ago. I do believe that is a trivia question, just in case you guys want to know. And so 130 million light years ago, they think thanks to this particular supernova, gold and platinum were being produced. So the cool thing is, a really wonderful thing just from a month and a half ago, a couple months ago, is that we found out that neutron star mergers do make elements. You were right. So. <laughs> now, I know I'm probably over time because that's what I do. So, <laughs> and I'm very sorry about this. I hope you guys don't mind me going over. 
But there's just a couple things I wanted to do and just kind of bring it back to our original theme of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And so there's just a few quotes. So there's a moment in every dawn when light floats. There's the possibility of magic. Creation holds its breath. And in this case, we held our breath, the neutron neutron star merger. And man, we got some really cool shit out of it. And this is my actual work, which I will not go into because we do not have enough time. But maybe next, next AOT. But basically, this is my experiment. And so my experiment works in the near infrared. So if you guys kind of kept in mind, there's, you know, gamma rays, x-rays, UV, you know, uh, optical, infrared, microwave, <laughs> radio. So that's the spectrum, right? And I actually work in the near infrared. And so here are two edge on views of our galaxy. And here's the Milky Way in one in the near infrared and the Milky Way in the visible. And you guys, can you see the difference? The near infrared is really able to penetrate all of this dust and crap that exists in our Milky Way galaxy. So we have a beautiful view on the galaxy. We're really able to see directly in, along the mid-plane and actually into the center. And so I will leave you with this quote. I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, thank you very much. We have time for a handful of questions. Please stand up and project as loudly as you can with the questions that you have to do. There was one screen that showed two different observatories, or maybe they were satellites that detected something. One was like 16 seconds after the event, and one was uh, an hour. How are they? I mean, so this is different parts of the event, right? This is not catching the same data, or how how does that work? So it's a really good question. Um, so basically, this is just tagging your your satellites and making sure that they come, um, you know, um, online and are open and, and receptive to the signal. That's kind of a hand wavy way of putting it, but it's kind of the truth. So for me, um, which just you know had to be positioned so that it received this, the signal almost simultaneously, right after the gravitational wave event. Integral is also a gamma ray um, observatory, also in space, but they were able to come online and look at the signal 66 minutes later, or at least be able to process the signal. That's, that's probably what I should say. Um, well, <laughs> it's, it's not necessarily that as, as opposed to, I mean, because the, the way the gravitational waves are actually received, or sorry, gamma rays are actually received, they're strong enough to trigger the detectors. It's more like being able to process, download, and understand that oh, this is what was going on. But really good question. Thanks. All right, I saw another potential question here. Okay. Uh, so my question was, um, why is it important that the gravitational waves receive pretty much the exact same time as the camera waves? Okay. So the question was, hey, uh, why is it you know, interesting that gamma rays and gravitational waves pretty much accompany one another? And that basically just said to us, hey, this is a compact object event. That's what that indicated. So because you know, you know, great, we have gravitational waves, black hole, black hole mergers would give off gravitational waves, but there's no accompanying other electromagnetic radiation. So once they got this signal, and they all kind of you know, localized it to one area of space, they were like, holy crap, this is a neutron neutron merger event. Yeah, go ahead, yes. So this is really recent how the hell do you know what a neutron star is made of and how it actually travels out of the that's going to be easy to answer. <laughs> so the question was, how the hell do we know what neutron stars are actually made out of, right? It's a little bit of physics, a little bit of astronomy, you roll it up together and you kind of get the answer, right? But the idea is, is that we're, since we're able to understand both density and pressure, right, we're able to extrapolate into these regimes what you know, the actual um, structure of the star would look like. Now, some of this is hypothesis, but we use another tool called spectroscopy. And spectroscopy essentially breaks apart the light. We saw some of the spectroscopy actually featured in, in some of the diagrams that we had. But that gives us compositions. That gives us concentrations. It's also able to give us densities. So we put all these pieces of puzzle together and just kind of understand, hey, this is probably what this is composed of. 
It is conjecture, some of it. Like when I said a bit about the quarks, that, that's a little bit of conjecture right now. But the apparent densities and pressures in this particular regime saying, hey, this is the only thing that could possibly be existing and still intact at these particular pressures and densities. So what is the crust of the neutron star made of, and why is that different than the interior? So good question. <laughs> so hold on, let me bring up my little cartoon diagram really quickly. So the thing is, um, what, what I didn't talk about um, is that um, when you have something that's supernovae, the star that's supernovae, at this point, it's actually made of a lot heavier elements. So I only talked about hydrogen and helium, really. But when you have these massive stars, you have this kind of fusion and nucleosynthesis going on, this element manufacture, which starts to make things heavier and heavier, like carbon, oxygen, magnesium, silk, and so forth and so on, all the way up to iron. And it turns out uh, iron is just a no-win process. It's just it's, it's a genetic. That's a bad word. But anyway, um, there's just no trying to fuse iron. A star can't do it. And then bam, it's super doubles. A lot of the outer layers are actually expelled into the interstellar medium. But what's normally left and captured by gravity is carbon and oxygen. There might be a little bit of neon. There might be a little bit of silicon. But the primary composition is carbon and oxygen. And that actually is what resides on the surface. That's what's really still able to remain intact right there. And that's actually what emits and permits light. So we'll actually see carbon and oxygen from these guys. Everything below this is stuff that is just completely broken apart, not even in atoms, just kind of coming out in this kind of neutron sewer, basically. So obviously I know that happened in the past, but how did we know that it was going to happen? Or how do we know to look in that area or to turn on all of our equipment to face it there to read all the data? Good question. Um, so essentially, LIGO picks up anything. It is it is uh, almost omnidirectional, if that would be an okay way to say it. It just picks up everything because gravitational waves. What was necessary is to have a LIGO facility in Washington, a LIGO facility in you know, Louisiana, and then one in Virgo. And the time delays, coupled with a bit of additional information, actually allowed for localization in the sky. But we just keep those suckers on. We're just waiting for really cool data to come in. Join me in thanking Jim one more time.